My next guest is the daughter of a famous filmmaker activist and she is making her own noise in the world. Meet a young woman who is driving liberals crazy. Welcome to another episode of Conversations. This is the show where we talk about anything and everything and whatever is on my mind. Uh, today, we are going to be talking with Danielle D'Souza Gill. She's the daughter of political activist, filmmaker, Dinesh D'Souza, and she's the author of a new book, The Choice, The Abortion Divide in America. And what I really like about this book, once we get to it, is that she takes on all the myths that you've heard about abortion and she demolishes what the left has to say. And so welcome Danielle to Conversations. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be here. Well, Danielle, um, you have been uh, busy since we spoke last and certainly since I saw you in New York. Uh, I understand that you were in your father's latest film. Yes, I was. Um, I talked a little bit about uh, the left and abortion and how um, for the left, abortion is something that's more important to them than the minimum wage. It's more important to them than um, illegal immigration, all these things, because abortion really gets to the heart of um, a lot of their kind of social ideology. Now, Danielle, do you... Are you a little bit perplexed at why the political left, and you're from New York, how they purport to care so much about human life well, around the coronavirus, you know, that they're trying to save as many lives as possible, so much so that, you know, we have had the mandatory mass, uh, and there are people that are pushing for mandatory uh, vaccines for the American public. And I think your state has a passport. I believe when I go to New York again, I might be asked to show my passport. Yeah, it's so horrible because even during the pandemic, when other businesses were ordered to shut down, other businesses had to do the shelter in place um, earlier on in the year, um, many abortion clinics continued operating. They continued to use PPE and they continued to have people gathering and basically flouted a lot of these orders from their governors all to say that abortion procedures are not elective procedures. Um, and so they basically were kind of justifying it and saying that regardless of the risk to other people's lives, according to their ideology with coronavirus, that they still were gonna continue to do that. So I don't think it's really about human life or safety or any of those things um, that they claim to care so much about, even when it comes to these uh, strict, you know, that vaccine situations that you're mentioning that they claim to care so much about, I think when it comes down to it, they don't actually care about that as much as some of these other issues that they seem to care about even more like abortion. Well, in Nashville, we had a strict sh shutdown and I called the abortion clinics just to see for myself that they were open and they were open for business uh, and taking appointments. And so that tells you a lot about how they really feel about human life. And what happened in New York with your governor and the nursing homes, and not just in New York, but other blue states where they sent COVID patients into nursing homes, to me, that says everything you need to know about how they feel about human life. Exactly. And just the entire cover up that Governor Cuomo did around it. And what's crazy is that that isn't even what's, you know, been his biggest controversy. I guess it's more of the Me Too allegations, but. I think how he how he treated these these people um, in nursing homes is even worse because it led to so many deaths and yet the left doesn't even seem to care about that issue as much as the other allegations against Well my theory on that uh, Danielle is that they are using uh, the women the me too women and I contend that there's an endless supply of women who are willing to step forward you know to accuse anyone and that it's just a distraction that they don't want to focus on what Cuomo did as well as some of the other Democratic governors when they sent COVID uh, patients into nursing homes 
to jeopardize the lives of those residents. And so I think that it's all like a distraction that they really don't care about the fact that some single man hit, a, hit on a lot of women. And you know, there are no real allegations of rape or anything like that. It just seems like he was a desperate single man trying to get a date as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and it's horrible because even with the COVID, um, he kept touting how great he was and wrote about how he handled it so wonderfully. And it's just the complete opposite. Whereas you know, Governor Ron DeSantis, who they're always criticizing and you know putting out bad press about, he actually handled it much better. But then Governor Cuomo wants to take all the credit when in fact he didn't handle it well at all. Well, I know that you've noticed this because I've noticed it and that with the political left that they will spin these false narratives and the media allows them to get away with the false narratives. And so they have an incentive to keep doing it because they know they will never be held accountable. That's so true. I mean, all of the mainstream media outlets are really friends with each other. They all um, push really the same type of stories, the same type of narrative, whether it's Biden, Harris, whoever it is, Governor Cuomo. Um, they're not actually interested in investigative reporting or in actually looking into these stories more deeply or telling us about, um, you know, just the facts aside from even their opinion, but they, 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 they won't even go there. And uh, Danielle, you have been so active on the abortion issue. Is there a particular reason other than the fact that I know that you're a very devout Christian that you chose abortion as your issue for this point in history? Yeah, um, I think just seeing how radical the left has become on abortion, we used to always hear that abortion should be safe, legal, and rare from the left. But when I moved to New York, I saw Governor Cuomo light up the Freedom Tower pink to celebrate nine-month abortions for no medical reason. So um, you don't have to have a complication or anything like that. Um, and I think just, just seeing um, how far it's gone from um, any kind of old position that the left used to have really just troubled me. And I, I wanted to write a book that could reach maybe some, some independent people on this issue, or even, um, you know, people who aren't political or people who are conservative, but maybe not that socially conservative, um, just really to show that this is a human rights issue. This is about human life. And um, I just, I just don't see how someone can be in favor of, of nine month abortions uh, without medical reasons. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that people understood here are the arguments the left's making, here are the myths that they're putting out about why abortion is so good for women, why abortion is so good for the children who would have otherwise had bad lives, or all these arguments they make and really debunk those um, in a way that responds to those myths. I think that uh, to me, the hypocrisy of the left when it comes to uh, the Black race, uh, Black people, that they pretend to be the champions, you know, of black people with critical race theory. Yet we know that that uh, in the black community, that black women that are thirteen percent of the population, they're getting thirty-seven percent of the abortions. And in the city of New York, there have been for a number of years more black babies aborted than were born alive. And so we know that. Uh, they don't care about black people. They don't care about human life. Uh, we're gonna take a break. Uh, and when we return uh, more about abortion and I want you to get into some of the arguments uh, that you have used to counter some of the myths. We'll be back in a second. Conversations with Dr. Carol Swain is made possible by Cooper Steele a family-owned business that provides the steel fabrications for some of the greatest buildings across the United States. 60 years ago, Kenneth and Faye Cooper founded their company in Shelbyville, Tennessee. Cooper Steel believes in sponsoring Carol Swain because we believe she does. You build strong, you stand strong. What started as a vision and now a nationally recognized and operated company that remains true to its founders' Judeo-Christian values and principles. Cooper Steel is committed to excellence, responsibility, and community. Cooper Steel's motto is, build strong, stand strong. They treat their employees and customers like family. Thank you to Cooper Steel for standing strong with conversations with Dr. Carol Swain. Learn more about our generous sponsor at coopersteel.com.
I'm back with my guest, uh, Dania D'Souza Gill, and we're talking about uh, a lot of things, but uh, abortion in particular. Uh, Danielle, would you give our viewers just uh, pick a few of your favorite myths that you have demolished and how the political left reacted uh, in the debates? Yeah, I guess picking up from where we were, um, I think one of the most powerful myths the left puts out is that abortion is actually good for the aborted person, that it's good for that child who would have otherwise lived a horrible life, or they would have otherwise been in poverty or, or lived in a home that was um, in a single parent household, whatever. Isn't arguments. that horrible? Because people like me, they're saying that we shouldn't have been born. That people, exactly. that a lot of Americans shouldn't have been born because their parents were not ready for them. Exactly. And they have no um, respect of human dignity, no um, hope that people can make their own personal decisions in life to, to get out of that situation. But I think it really mirrors the arguments um, in the time of slavery when uh, there were the Lincoln-Douglas debates. It actually mirrors a lot of the abortion arguments very similarly because um, Douglas, who was a Democrat, argued for pro-choice for slavery. He said each state, each state should be able to argue or vote whether or not they want slavery. So we can vote it up or down. And then Lincoln said, um, no, you know, I'd like to see slavery tried on that person personally. He was in favor of slavery and he didn't want to extend slavery. But Douglas's argument seemed really powerful because he was saying, oh, well, choice seems like a really good thing. And if people choose um, to have slaves or not, that's up to them as well as up to that state. And I think that's what people say with abortion. It's like, well, that's your choice to be pro-choice or that's that state's decision. And um, it really just completely devalues that human life because if this is actually a person in, in both situations, then we can't allow that. We can't allow the dismemberment of, of human beings that are uh, just like the rest of us. You know something, it must be very uh, difficult intellectually to be a liberal and to be thinking because uh, half the time they argue, follow the science, follow the science. And when it comes to uh, the science around when life begins, well, they discount that line, science. They don't know when life begins. And if they had to accept the fact that they are justifying and what they're doing is they're justifying um, uh, really uh, the murder of an unborn child uh, because they're saying that the wishes of the mother trumps uh, whatever rights the child might have. Exactly. And I think they get caught into such a, um, a cognitive dissonance because the science does tell us that this is a human in every way. Its DNA is human. Its DNA is different from its mothers and fathers. It has all of its own DNA, even um, early on in the first trimester. It has its own heartbeat. It pumps its own blood through its own heart. And so we know that this is a unique being. We can measure its brain waves, all of these things. Even we can measure later pain and, and so on. So this idea that they're following the science is completely wrong. They are willing to just throw away science in order to promote their ideology of, um, um, I guess, mass killing is really what it is, but in the guise of freedom or, or some kind of self-fulfillment. And, you know, Danielle, one of the things that really troubles me is that the, quote, progressive church, because there's some progressive churches that uh, pretty much support the liberal agenda of the left. And there are a lot of Black churches, you know, that are filled with Democrats. And we know that the Democratic Party is the party of abortion. They have to discount all the scriptures like Jeremiah 1.5 before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. And all the scriptures that talk about how God uh, foreknew us and he knew our personalities. And you know, for the secular world, none of this matters. And so I can concede, okay, if you don't believe in God, you don't believe in the Bible, it's not relevant. But for anyone who professes to be a Christian, there are just, I mean, there, there at least, I can think of three or four scriptures that talk about life in a way that um, you can't discount the fact that each individual is unique and uh, that human life is sacred and that we as humans are in the image of God. And if you wanna care about human dignity and human rights, you would start with the most vulnerable human beings. 
Absolutely. And I think just this whole idea that the left even cares about the most vulnerable, which is what they act like, is just so not true because um, these little children are the most vulnerable. And this idea of someone being a, a pro-choice Christian, I think is just such an oxymoron, like um, Senator Warnick in, in Georgia, who's a pro-choice pastor. I mean, yeah. Leading pastor of evil. Yes. Leading up to the runoff, I was just wanting to talk about that because I just was like, this is just so mind blowing that he's using um, his religion, his Christianity to justify abortion um, and even claim that that's somehow um, in line with the Bible. But I think even aside from that, even if you're not Christian, like we said, the science shows us this is what a human being is. And um I think Christopher Hitchens, the atheist, put it really well. He's, he actually was uh, pro-life in, in many ways, I think, except for rape and incest. But he wrote that, um, you know, we only have one life to live. And he was a materialist. So he believed that at the end of life, there's just pure annihilation. And he believed that if that's my only life, then it really is the worst thing you can do to me to take my one life. And so I think even if you're not religious, you can view it as, wow, you know, this human life is... Um, being wiped out really just so early on into their into their life and uh, Danielle uh, what are some other well I'm interested in the reactions to your book and whether or not big tech has tried to censor you and your message yeah so um, I think they do for everyone they mostly actually would go after videos that I would make kind of um, talking about abortion because I think that uh, for some reason, videos are very triggering for, for the left. They'll say, you know, out of context or, or whatever it is, um, even if it's from a literal abortion doctor talking about the truth of what abortion is. Um, but no, I think despite that, it's it's gone uh, really well. Unfortunately, it's reached a lot of people. It, um, I think, was like number one Amazon for abortion and has definitely um, been a, a I think hopefully uh, an influential to some people out there. I wonder if any uh, college uh, campuses or classes have adopted, I mean, probably not because uh, college has changed, but when I was teaching, you tried to bring different sides to an issue and you wanted students to think. And I think that the way you attack the major myths uh, about, about abortion would be, you know, great for a classroom discussion because you'd, you'd have just tons of things for students to debate. Uh, do you know if anyone's used it in a classroom setting? I don't know yet. There was a, um, a school in Michigan that I went to that had, um, um, I think, some, some discussion over kind of the, the pro-choice and then pro-life argument, and that was very cool. I would love to see more of that just because I think that's so lost today, that discussion, that debate, hearing, you know, what's the response to this? And I even um, looked at other classroom curriculums that are, of course, m many of them for choice and saw, you know, wow, they never hear the response to right. these arguments. So um, I would love to see that. Well, Danielle, we'll be back after this moment for my sponsors. Dr. Carol Swain's Be the People a call to reclaim America's faith and promise, newly released in paperback and audio with a new introduction, is a challenge to all Americans. If you are serious about being the best citizen you can be, this is the book for you. From addressing moral relativism to reclaiming the future, you'll understand why Dr. Swain is one of the most relevant voices in today's culture war. Are you ready to reclaim America's faith and promise? Purchase at bethepeoplenews.com front slash books or wherever books are sold. The Biden administration's executive order on immigration brings to the forefront one of the most volatile issues of our time. In this timely second edition of Debating Immigration, I join my voice to that of other experts to provide you with facts and information that will help you understand what is at stake for our nation. This edition offers 21 original essays that cover race, religion, economics, human smuggling, and civil rights. Purchase at bethepeoplenews.com front slash books or wherever books are sold. I'm back with uh, Danielle DeSousa Gill. And uh, Danielle, you've not had any uncomfortable encounters uh, on the streets of New York or anywhere since you have been 
out there so publicly, not just uh, on abortion, but also you were a big Donald Trump supporter. Yes, um, fortunately, I haven't had any 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 violence on the streets towards me that I've seen. Um, I have. Well, seen wait, do they recognize you, or do they just confuse you with sure? <laughs> oh my goodness, uh, that that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, no, so I'm trying to think. I feel like it's only really ever happened when there are liberals hanging around on purpose outside of, let's say, you know, a Trump event or a, something like that. And they're sort of trying to like record something or be an agitator where they would be on, um, aware of that kind of stuff. But no, I, I'm not recognized in, in random, you know, airports and restaurants or anything. Don't, don't worry. Um, so yeah, but I think the left is just, they're so, so vigilant um, when it comes to being against Trump supporters. So once they know you're a Trump supporter, of course, you have to always just be aware. Well, I am so impressed uh, with your book, but I know that that's not your first book. It's your second book. Would you tell our viewers about the first book that I wrote an endorsement of while you were in high school? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, my first book was called Why God, an intelligent discussion on the relevance of faith. It was my first book. Um, I was 17 when it came out, and it was really kind of structured a little similarly to this book, but basically responding to questions young people have about God, um, more in the apologetics realm. So responding to a question like, how can there be a good God who allows suffering, or how can miracles really be possible? Or, um, you know, was Jesus actually an historical person or um, questions like that. And um, I was really just inspired to kind of engage more because I felt like a lot of young people weren't grappling with these questions of faith. And um, at least not in the, not in the way that I, I felt like would reach them the best. So that was my first book. And then I went to college and really just wanted to focus on, um, on classes and writing for those. Um, so yeah, once I graduated, I was definitely ready to, to take on my next topic. And I think abortion was just a very important one. Now, have you moved on to a third topic for the next book? Yes, I am thinking about it right now. I have a couple options of what I'm thinking of. One idea that I want to do is um, the leftist infiltration of the church and religious institutions. Important. And what we discussed, how they're <laughs> using... Um, a lot of uh, references to God, a lot of that to bring people to the left to kind of create this socialist Christianity. Um, Harris kind of does that. Even Biden will pull on his um, Catholic tendencies in order to justify leftist things. So that's one of my ideas, but definitely something in, the, in this realm of um, uh, political and, and religious themes. And do you uh, see yourself uh, uh, being involved in future films with your father? And was that a great experience? It was a great experience. Yes, he's, he's working on a few more films and, and I'm definitely excited to see those. They're, they're gonna be great. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I love to kind of just be part of, of the whole process. Even if I'm not in the film, just you know, learning, le learning along the way. Well, I uh, have been, you know, watching you for many years, and I'm certainly proud of the work that you're doing in the world, because I know that there's a tremendous price to be paid to put yourself out publicly, especially in an environment where people don't respect other people's rights. Oh, well, thank you, Carol. You're so inspiring. I mean, your story is so incredible, and I feel like you are such a testament to the fact that, um, you know, these arguments that the left makes when it comes to abortion or whatever it is, they just, they really fall flat. And so I think that's a really special story that you have. And are you uh, encouraged about the future? Like there's a part of me that despite how bad it looks out there, I'm optimistic and I'm optimistic because there's so many young people and, you know, some of them are with Prager Force. And I know you've done a Prager video some are with Blexit, uh, some are with uh, the Clara Luce Booth Center, uh, and um, just these various organizations, Young America's Foundation. There are a lot of conservative young people who are trying to make a difference, but I don't think we've ever had an environment where you have so many 
forces against you as far as the media and big tech and the ability to cancel someone? Yes, yes. I think the canceling is the worst because we actually do have so many young people who are conservative, but um, I think the fact that we don't have our own platforms completely yet or we don't have our own institutions make it so that they can cancel us. And um, so I really look forward to these alternate platforms taking off the social media. And even I think it might get to the point where we need our own workplaces. We need our own, all these things because young conservatives in college, they're afraid, you know, I can't get a job. I can't, um, you know, apply to this place because I once posted a photo in a MAGA hat or whatever it is. And so fortunately uh, we're, you know, working on things where uh, we can do that and, and not be canceled necessarily. But I mean, normal people, I feel like it's, it's hard because they could be fired. And so we have to make it so that these companies are really pressured and so that they realize that they can't do that. We are not going to support them. And um, I think that's the most important thing. I think so too. And so many of the companies that are doing the virtue signaling, the big corporations, it's clear to me that they're taking the, you know, the easiest path they're not even taking time to actually understand the issues and whether or not they had the right perspective, because if they were, they would not be behind, you know, the critical race theorists and their diversity, equity, inclusion, which does the opposite. And they would not be out there now pressing for, um, you know, a voting rights bill that strips Americans of rights. And I think we have our work cut out for us when it comes to educating uh, the people, but also pressuring those corporations to get back to the business of making profits and not trying to change the country. Yes. And I think at the end of the day, a lot of those companies, they are pressured by the left because these leftist agitators um, are really influential in the culture. So they're like, oh, my company or, or my brand isn't going to reach people or isn't going to be covered anymore in this because all these leftists who control the media are going to trash our company. And I think that we have to have our own institutions so that we can then say, wow, you know, look what this company is doing. Look what this company is doing. Right. Because they're so quick to jump on our, our people or, or anyone who's um, to the right and kind of do hit jobs on them. And we can't ever really do the same because we don't have the same megaphones as them. So that's why I really feel like the, the alternate platforms is so essential. And some people say, well, oh, but then we're living in two different worlds where we have two different platforms. And it's like, they can join these platforms too. They, they're welcome to join. Right. Um, but we just, we can't be beholden to them. And Dania, I want to thank you so much for being on Conversations. I'd love to have you back on. And we just have a few seconds. So tell our viewers once again, how they can get in contact with you. Yes, I'm Danielle D'Souza Gill on all social media platforms. So definitely find me on, on those. And um, I'm on all the main ones as well as the alternate platforms that I know of. Um, and my book is called The Choice, The Abortion Divide in America. You can get it in the hardcover, but it's also on Audible if you prefer audiobook version. Thank you so much, Danielle. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back uh, after this word from my sponsors. For those of you who would like to know what exactly our children are facing in their education system, this is a must read book. It will equip you and prepare you to make decisions about your child's health, about your child's education. So I wanna encourage every one of you to grab a copy of Dr. Swain's book and join with me and Carol on the front lines in this critical time to eradicate the liberal abduction of our children. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Conversations. I highly recommend Dania D'Souza Gill's book on abortion. She does an excellent job of demolishing all the myths that you hear from the political left, from the pro-abortion side. I'm very encouraged by young people like her. They are our future. We have to support them. They will help us take back our nation and our world. Thank you.